I'm Kathleen Staten here with Music Constructed and members of the education community along with Rich Bresky, who is going to help us understand more about P-Buzz in the elementary music classroom. So uh, before we get started, I'd love to introduce our teachers who are here with us today. Hi, my name is Sarah. I taught in Chicago Public Schools for 11 years. I taught general music, band, choir, mariachi, guitar, all of it. And currently the last two years, I've been teaching in the suburbs of Chicago in Des Plaines, teaching general music, band, and choir. Hi, I'm Dan Welch, and I am a K-6 educator with the Camel City Schools District, which is just a small uh, district just outside of Youngstown, Ohio, about halfway between Cleveland, Ohio and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I am a K-4 general music teacher and a 5-6 uh, band teacher director as well. And I've been doing that for about 15 years. Hi, my name is Brad Seagraves. I teach in the Gilbert School District in Arizona, which is a, a suburb of Phoenix. Um, Gilbert Schools is one of the largest school districts in the state. Um, and I've been with that district now. This is my 34th year. So my entire career has been in Gilbert. I have a little bit of experience teaching general music, but uh, most of my experience is elementary band grades five and six. Terrific to have you all here. And Rich from PBuzz. I'm Rich, Rich Bresky. I'm the U.S. representative for Warwick Music that makes the PBuzz as well as P Bow and P Trumpet and uh, um, plastic instruments of high quality. Um, so uh, I've been in the music products industry working with music educators for nearly 40 years. So it's surprising to me as well, but here I am. And uh, um, it's been it's just been an exciting journey for me. I'm happy to share this information about PBuzz and what it's doing for kids all around the country and really around the world. That's fantastic. As many of us know, there are a lot of non-traditional ways to be engaging students with instruments and music making in the elementary classroom. We're really at this experiential time as we're reimagining what does the music classroom look like? What does music curriculum look like? And then how are we gaining traction with our students who have such a variety of musical experiences uh, that they bring into our classrooms? Um, so uh, Brad, you mentioned that you have that sort of band program in that five and sixth grade grade um, uh, age group. Can you tell me a little bit more about how does that band work at that age and, and what instruments do you use to engage them? Um, it's, it's a traditional beginning band program. We start basically from scratch. We tell the kids in fifth grade, you don't need to know anything. We're even going to teach you how to open the case. But it is very traditional woodwinds, uh, brass, and percussion instruments. Um, we do use, or at least I use P-Buzz at the beginning stages, especially with my brass players to help them learn how to create a buzz and help them learn how to use proper airflow before we transition into the more traditional uh, brass instruments, including trumpet, mostly trumpet, trombone, and euphonium. Um, I do allow kids to play tuba and French horn, but usually not until the second year. I feel like as a music educator and general elementary specialist, I may have gone at this backwards by starting with you, Brad, because <laughs> <laughs> we we really didn't talk about what does that mean when we're talking about PBAs and brass in the right. elementary classroom. So I'm going to ping back to, to Sarah, and maybe okay. you could talk to us about how does that compare to, for example, using recorders in the elementary classroom? Sure. So I've actually used P buzzes, recorders, and then also bucket band in my um, general music elementary classrooms. And I found that the the way to have the most success that with my kids, they was um, alternating between the three, using all three instruments. And it prepared them not only for band, but really it just got them excited about playing as an ensemble. It was really fun to do kind of bucket drumming and pee buzz at the same time. Students got to you know, play different instruments. They got to hear how music could come together and they got to be a part of creating something together, creating something musically, um, composing or improvising their own melodies and um, also, you know, learning how to read music in that sense as well. So it was really cool seeing how students who had, you know, success on one instrument was able to carry that over to another instrument. And the cool thing about the P-Buzz is all the kids can get a sound out with it. So they really have that kind of instant gratification or instant 
feeling of accomplishment or feeling of success. And so just seeing them grow with that and just feeling great about playing music is what makes it most fun to use. Rich, I'm sure you love to hear that, that all kids could get a sound out of the P-Buzz because of course the P-Buzz is like a beginning trumpet, right? And uh, you can't say the same about giving a student a trumpet, can you? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even classify it as a beginning instrument. It's really an early learning instrument. And I think that uh, you know, uh, as we've experienced in first in the UK where this was introduced and then in other parts of the world and finally in the United States, we realized that we have to just continually back up into elementary to say, okay, what are we really doing here? What are we really teaching? And, um, you know, one of the things that, that we've established with the PBUS is that it really teaches kids how to use air. And using using air is certainly a, a band element for sure, um, but it's also a singing element. If you can use air, you're a better singer. Um, I think if you can use air, uh, uh, you know, you're a better dancer. If you can use air, you're you know a better you know you're better in just general health. Um, using air to me is a, you know is is what is one of the basic things that we backed into, including, and, you know, other things are like basic music skills, uh, listening to each other, you know, oral, oral, uh, you know, um, not only listening to the teacher, but listening to each other play on the ensemble, like, like Sarah talked about, um, visual, watching each other, the, the, uh, you know, the, the teacher can, can see the six notes on the P buzz and see, and see where the, where the, where the student is, and the students can look at each other too, if they need to. So there's can the, the visual, students there's actually see that? Can the students see where they are when they're playing as well? Not themselves, but I've seen a few trumpet players looking at, okay, which valves do I put down? I'm going to look over here and see what that looks like. And uh, um, But it's really more important for the teacher to see, because we're playing an ensemble, you may not be able to hear what's going on, but you can see. And then just the kinesthetic, uh, the fact that this is, a, this, is a, this is, you know, uh, um, you know, these are kind of macro movements here. And everybody can do that. And uh, in fact, I was talking with a teacher whose who's expertise is in disabilities. And he said, PBUS is great because it's not these fine motor skills that, you know, it, there's these gross motor skills that become, that every kid can do without getting out the tissues. I'll just say, I'll just stop there and say, this is an exciting tool for every music educator in the elementary schools. Dan, tell me about uh, how you feel that the PBUS has impacted air and music making in your classroom. Well, you know, I, I would like to follow up with a lot of what Rich said. Um, you know, one of the things that was so um, important to our district and our music program in our district when PIPAs came along was, was not only capitalizing on the enthusiasm of getting students instruments earlier, um, but really working on what we was talking about and, and getting our students ready for that next level, that, that junior middle school and middle school level, whether they go into choir or band, um, and capitalizing on those earlier elementary successes and teaching them how to, to get that air production and, and, and expand their lungs and making sure that they're, they're using all the available air that they can. Um, and one of the things we began to saw, uh, or excuse me, we began to see was um, how much of an improvement and our overall tone quality um, in our beginning band and our beginning choirs. We're starting to see students understand, you know, how these instruments work, um, whether it be a physical instrument like a P buzz or moving on to those uh, more traditional concert band instruments or the instruments that we carry here uh, in our throats with our vocal cords for our, for our choirs. Um, so it's one of the huge, huge benefits of this, this early learner instrument um, is getting them to really understand the importance and benefits of breathing correctly um, and, and utilizing breath and ultimately how it translates into tone production. Um, how do you incorporate the PBAs into your curriculum? So is it uh, alongside recorders? Is it separate from? Um, what's the point of engagement? Yeah, great question. So kind of following up what Sarah was talking about um, years ago when we um, had several other music teachers uh, in our building. It's down to just me now. Um, but uh, we divided up where we did 12 weeks on P-Buzz, 12 weeks on recorder, and 12 weeks on glockenspiel. Um, and it provided students an opportunity to explore instruments in, um, you know, what we would term, you know, those three out of the four instrument families. Um, and 
we would do that starting in fourth grade because of our our choir and band program beginning in fifth grade. It was an opportunity to see if students were interested in performing arts um, and then having them focus in on what aspect of instrumental music that they were interested in. Um, so where it comes down now to is um, it's just a P buzz now, and we continually use that in fourth grade. I continue to use that in fourth grade as a way to assess um, students' interest level in fine arts and performing arts, and uh, also to prepare them if they are going to go forward into band uh, in fifth and sixth grade with some of those beginner skills that they'll need right as we start their fifth grade year. I'd love to hear more about the specific curriculum pieces that you use. So are you using um, iconic notation? Are you focusing on actual songs that you're performing or, or how does that work? So for my program, um, because I do PBOS over the course of a year now, I'm able to slow the rate of the program down a little bit and spend a little bit more time um, exploring iconic notation. So teaching note reading skills, um, teaching, you know, the music staff and some of those foundational level theory. Um, and generally by the end of October here, beginning of November, we're to the point where they're going to receive a PBOS, get a PBOS into their hands, and we're going to start reading music. Um, as far as the curriculum materials, one of the great things that um, Rich and Brad and, and Sarah and I and many others have been working on um, over the last year is really coming up with what a lot of what we use in our own classrooms and creating uh, the PBOS journey, which I'll, I'll hold up here, uh, which is a phenomenal new resource for, for teachers um, to have as a curriculum piece to, to take step by step by step, um, not only for themselves as educators, to prepare them, but to take their students along on this PBUS journey as well. So um, that has really refined my curriculum in use with, with the PBUS. And um, I believe, you know, Brad and Sarah both have experience as well with, with the ways in which they use this curriculum as, as well in their classrooms. I think this one is worth unpacking with each one of you since you come from different vantage points. So I invite you to share yeah, your application in the classroom. Um, okay, I'll go next then. Um, so I started with PBUS with second graders. So although by the end of the year, we are definitely learning how to read notes and read actual music, in the beginning, we did start um, learning orally and learning by looking, you know, at the colors of the PBUS and combining things that way. And I found that this was a really good connection to the first grade curriculum where you're learning about going up in pitch with your voice and going down in pitch with your voice and um, kids could sing it and then play it. So they were able to make that connection in second grade. So um, that was something I found really helpful to kind of connect them from first to second grade. And then after that, we could do things like, okay, maybe we're not reading the notes yet, but we can draw on a music staff that notes are moving upward and we can play that on our PBAs. And then we hear and we can visually see how it looks together. And then we, we would put it together with notes um, and actual reading of music in second grade. And then when I used it with my third graders, we would combine the two, doing some oral learning, some note reading. And when I did it with my fourth graders, at that point, it was a lot of just note reading and preparing them for instrumental or vocal music, whatever they chose to join in fifth or sixth grade. But also they still had that aspect of being able to be creative when we do improvising, they wouldn't have to write out the notes they were playing. They would just kind of make it up and they could hear the pitches moving up and down. So we were still combining that that aspect of general music that's really important with the super younger grades. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm learning as much uh, as our audiences are today because I had never used these in an earlier classroom. Um, and uh, that concept of high-low is, is fantastic, which I just have to ask before we go on to Brad, you know, when you're making the sound on the PBAs, is that a challenging thing to do? I mean, I, I dabbled in French horn in middle school, so I know how much strength is required there, but obviously that's not what the children need to be successful with this kind of an instrument. Right. And the one of the first things I like to teach the second graders is a, a glissando on the p -buzz. It's fun. It's like one of the most fun things that they get to do. So they just start with the p -buzz out as far as it goes. They bring it in as far as it goes. And if they're not getting that glissando right away, we say more air. So we're Sarah, already waiting. Turn that. around, get yep. it off the shelf. You got to demonstrate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, I have it. Okay. I don't know how <laughs> let's do it, but let's do it. Let's do a gliss. Here we go. Mm -hmm. 
Yay! <laughs> it's fun. It gets them using the air, but also that's that initial low high sound for those little kids that helps them make the connection. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Oh, that's fine. I don't mind. <laughs> and what did what kind of structure did you have to do with your mouth in order to make that sound happen? Okay, so I generally, when I'm just teaching them, I want them to get a sound right away. So I say, say, mm, we make that mm sound with our lip. Then we think of buzzing like a bee. I usually will have them do it on the back of their hand if they're spread out far enough. Mm -hmm. Then we just put it on the instrument and they just like making silly noises. It's fun being silly when you're in second grade. My my experience with P-Buzz is fourth grade and uh, fifth grade. and But even a lot of those kids struggle to make it, uh, sounds on a traditional trumpet mouthpiece or even a trombone mouthpiece, the size just isn't right. And that's what I really like about the P-Buzz. The mouthpiece is, is kind of that middle range size. It's between a trumpet and a trombone. And it, there's just something about how that fits, no matter how big or small the kid is. Um, that size of the mouthpiece is so much easier for them to get a sound on. And um, I've done some uh, preliminary P-Buzz classes with some fourth graders, kind of getting them excited and ready for band. And um, I've gone into the general music classrooms as a volunteer and gone in and just said, hey, I'm going to teach your classes for a week. Will you let me do that? And we just have fun with P-Buzz, give the kids that initial experience. But then with my fifth graders at the very beginning of the school year, I don't get their mouthpieces out first. I have a whole set of P-Buzz and mouthpieces that I give the kids just to teach them how to make that sound and use that airflow. And um, it's a, fan a fantastic transition from that into, into the trumpet size or the, or the trombone size. So uh, that's, that's been my experience with it. And um, from a curricular standpoint, the P-Buzz Journey book has a lot of the uh, activities and things that I use in my beginning band classroom to get kids to use better airflow, to get kids to uh, produce uh, better buzz. Um, there are a lot of tips and tricks in there for the non-instrumental teacher as well, like, the, like what Sarah just described with creating the buzz and um, doing things like learning how to change pitch or just activities to, you know, games I like to call them with my kids. Let's play a game and we're going to learn how to use our air in the process, right? I'm really glad that you touched on that uh, accessibility, not just for the students, but also for the teachers. I have a logistical question just about, you mentioned that the students don't see the colors. So how are you um, assessing for success that is beyond the high-low uh, timbre recognition um, and maybe before you would get to a point where you were really proficient and able to either orally identify or maybe with a partner identify where you were on the slide? I think the color coding helps them get comfortable to where the slide needs to go for different notes. So it's, it becomes a feel for them. Um, and as Rich touched upon earlier, just having an, uh, one more way for the teacher to assess, you know, both orally and visually, um, you know, being able to do those quick assessments. And, you know, if you're District requires data collection. You can do a quick assessment, quick data collection, uh, both visually and orally by um, having that so colorful, it helps the teacher in addition to the student. Probably also aiding in a non-specialist being able to assess. Yeah, that's true. And they, it's also labeled by um, note number and by a note letter name as well. So you have that, uh, that teaching ability when you're learning about uh, the notation, you can match the color to the note name, to the notation. So it's all, it's all very much uh, in sync with, with all those different elements. Yeah, so as I was just going and showing that, it does show C and then it shows the number for it as well. And then the color, obviously. And to add on, um, I like to teach students how to self-assess a little bit as we're playing. So when we're learning a new song, um, we might like say together, let's put, our, let's say we're learning the beginning of Hot Cross Buns. Let's put our hand right here on the A so the students can knock at the slide past that. And we might sing the letters together, A, G, F. That way they can look at it while they're doing it. 
they can see it and feel where it goes. So that way, when it's time to play it, we put it together and they already have that feel. So you can do that with the numbers, four, five, six. You can do it with the colors. You could say like purple, blue, yellow, or you could just say the letter name. So there's a easy way to kind of help students learn um, not only orally, not only visually, but by feeling it as well. So they can start assessing themselves if they're in the right spot as well. And then how do you use these in ensembles? Are you pairing them with maybe other orf instruments or recorders? Or I know one of you mentioned that they're standalone units, but then does that mean that your entire class is on PBAs or, or how do you do that? Um, I have done it with my students. So one thing that I really liked doing is giving them the opportunity to perform with other kids. Um, so when we had pep assemblies, there are things that you can play on the PBAs that you could play um, in a band. It's like, we will rock you or um, dun, 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 let's go band. Um, so I would have them perform with like the choir and the band kids at pep assemblies at school. And then um, my third graders, we did like a whole unit on PBuzz and then we got to let them perform with the band at one of our concerts on a piece called Yo PBuzz. So that was really fun because they got to be involved in an actual band concert at the end of the year. Um, and it was a really cool way to get more parents involved in the school and get them excited for future choir and instrumental music programs as well. So very similar to, to Sarah and Brad, um, one of the things that we do for an accompaniment or I do for an accompaniment is um, sometimes I'll, I'll play the, you know, harmonic, um, you know, improvised harmonic backing to my P buzz classes on the piano uh, while they play. I have four sections of, of fourth grade students. So uh, when we get to concert time, each section or each class will have different repertoire to perform from. So they're getting to hear what, you know, the other classes um, have been learning. Uh, and then we'll do um, P buzz choirs. So we may have two classes play a song together and then we always close with all four classes um, playing. So about a hundred P-Buzz players um, playing I Feel Good by James Brown, which incorporates one of those early, um, you know, techniques that Sarah was talking about, the glissando. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, the parents get really involved with it and excited with it as well. Um, so, you know, I think one of the really great things uh, that this curriculum provides is the flexibility um, to accompany the PBAs, whether it be through just solo PBAs or small group PBAs or mass PBAs choirs, vocals. And one of the things that, that we're working on in our district is exactly what Sarah talked about, which is um, to be able to combine the fourth grade PBAs with fifth grade band and to play together and almost have that, you know, mentoring uh, towards the end of the year selling you know, an instrumental ensemble fifth grade as an option for a class. One of those basic, one of those basic things about the P buzz that we don't talk about because we just all know it is that the P buzz is in the key of C. So accompaniment, whether it be with recorder or it's it's in the key of C, so it's easy to combine accompaniments and and you know, as well as combining with band or with choir. Uh, it's 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 an easy add on from that standpoint. That is a great thing to have remembered. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Rich. I know I was curious, um, Sarah, specifically about whether or not this was a direct correlation with your mariachi work or if it was really separate. So that was separate. Um, I started mariachi um, my last two years and we had a smaller ensemble and we're really kind of learning how to um, play together with that particular ensemble because each student had their own part. Like we had two different vihuela parts and two different guitaron parts and one singer and one clarinet and one trumpet. So um, that ensemble worked separately. I imagine if I had been at that particular school years past that, it, it could be something that could have been combined in the future, but that particular ensemble wasn't ready for that yet. But the choir, the band, combining those with pibas, those were things that I could... Um, you know, do more instantly because it's a larger group of students and similar keys and easier to play in. When we talk about the music that's being prepared and so going back to the P Buzz Journey method book that we've talked about, the actual the, the songs that we have in the in the P Buzz Journey method book are songs that these teachers have used and recommended 
um, including sp school of spirit songs, including modern band songs, including mariachi songs, um, including jazz songs, including traditional songs that you would normally play on recorder, as well as holiday songs. And uh, all these have backing tracks uh, that are um, accessible, whether the, whether you're a, you're a teacher teaching a classroom or where the child takes the instrument at home, they can pull it up on their phone using a QR code and they can play play right along. So this is really maybe not just an in-class instrument, but it's a take-home instrument as well. And uh, uh, so it's been really great to, to actually use songs that teachers use and recommend for PBAs. And they're really the, the same great songs that, that every elementary teacher wants to incorporate and every kid wants to play, especially those modern band songs and school spirit songs. Those are very, very popular. And I think, you know, the one of the great aspects of the PBAs journey um, method book that Rich was talking about is the number of songs that are in there provides multiple opportunities for cross-curricular education, um, being able to partner with other classrooms in your school, uh, and uh, not only have your students with you in the music classroom, perhaps learning some of those mariachi songs that are provided in there, you know, to tie in, we just wrapped um, Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, so, you know, being able to tie some of those things together, um, it really helps to make the music programs within your school, not so much on an island, but really folded nicely into the, the larger school community and, and understanding all of the benefits that what happens in content area classrooms um, is just as important as what's happening in our fine and performing arts classrooms. You know, Dan, that's such a great segue. I have heard you all touch on so many aspects of pain points for general classroom music teachers and even those who are uh, not music specialists but are in those roles. Uh, and I was just about to ask, what is your favorite thing to be able to accomplish with the PIBAs that maybe you wouldn't have been able to accomplish with traditional uh, elementary music instruments? The success that students get on this instrument so quickly builds an immense level of confidence so quickly. Uh, it, 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 for many, creates a spark on something that they probably never would have thought of before. Um, oh, now I want to learn how to play instruments. I want to join band. I want to join choir. I want to perform. Um, so that, that really those early successes that really helps enforce all of those social emotional pieces that have really been a target in, in our district and in our state. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I know I will not remove PBUS from my curriculum um, just because of the benefits. Um, you may not be good at math, but to see them, oh my gosh, I, I can play an instrument right away. I, I'm not great at social studies or science or, you know, gym, but this is something that I could concede on, succeed on very well um, and very, very quickly and, and be able to build off of that. So um, for me, that's probably been the greatest um, thing to to watch with my students utilizing this PBUS instrument in the curriculum. I, I have to agree 100%. I just think the excitement that this instrument brings is everything that makes music fun and makes a general music class great that instant success, that feeling the kids get when they're like, man, I made one note. Now I can do two. I can do three. And the cool thing is if you're improvising or composing, there's really no way to, you know, mess up. Whereas on a more traditional instrument, if you don't necessarily have the right fingers down or your embouchure is not in the correct partial, you know, people are going to, their classmates might know they're making a mistake, but with this FIBAs, you just be like, that's what I meant to do. And it just gets them really confident. And they're just, having fun and just seeing that excitement and students that maybe even in music class had more challenges early on when this instrument was put in their hand, I just saw a lot more success and I had large class sizes and um, we had so many amazing diverse learners in my classes and I just especially loved seeing when students who had more specific needs had success on this instrument and became even more excited to come to class. So I just think it's a really inclusive instrument for all kids. I think, you know, the younger, the better, they just have so much fun at it. And that, that excitement is what makes this instrument great to use. It's the opportunity, I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of teachers around the country who use PBAs and I have to just reinforce um, this whole, this whole statement. Um, uh, I had a teacher who was doing a clinic in, Phil in Philadelphia for the general music or general music teacher. They were actually doing the clinic with the kids. 
And so there's a, there a room full of kids, about 50 kids learning to play PIBAs. And it was a, teaching it in an hour, basically, so they can they can learn to play uh, I Feel Good, you know, along with a backing track, which was successful. And at the end, afterwards, one of the teachers came up and apologized to the clinician because he didn't tell them that the first row was full of special needs learners. And, it, and nobody noticed because they were able to incorporate these simple tasks, basic music skills, into success for, as, as Sarah said, all different levels of learners. <laughs> and that just, you know, that... I know that makes us all smile when we think of here's something that we can all do together. And so and that's a that's just an inspiring story to me. And Brad, bring us home. Tell us what, what's your favorite goal to accomplish with PBUS? Well, just to touch upon what they were saying, I think the fact that fine motor skills aren't really needed on the PBUS, the kids just pick it up so quickly. I mean, Really, that's the thing that slows us down in the traditional band setting, right? Is are your fingers covering that hole completely on that clarinet? And it's just, um, it takes so much longer to build that success. And as Dan mentioned, that confidence that the kids gain. And the, as I mentioned before, the size of the mouthpiece is just perfect to get that first buzz. And the gross motor skills make it so easy for kids to learn it and be successful quickly and learn to play songs right away because really that's what they want to do, right? Right. They want to make a sound for sure, but hey, it's all about making music. And that's the thing I I love the most about PBuzz is just the the accessibility for all students. The baby bear interaction, right? Papa bear, mama bear, it's the just right, everything in between. <laughs> um, a new way to look at maybe non-traditional wins in your elementary classroom. Well, Brad, Dan, Sarah, and Rich, thank you so much for being here to talk with authority about what does it mean to incorporate this instrument into your classroom. And it was truly inspiring to hear about both the successes of your students and also about all of the ways that PIBAs can impact not just your classroom and your students, but the greater community of parents and teachers as well.